Can somebody remind me to turn that off when I'm done? So many things to remember. <laughs> Actually, I did. See, I, I put turn on record. Turn off record. So <laughs> that's if we get to that page, though. That's the only problem. <laughs> All right. So we're in uh, 1 Timothy 3. And last time we began with statement 47, which we're going to uh, continue with. I'll just read that again. And although the particular congregations speak distinct and several bodies, everyone as a compact and knit city within itself, yet are they all to walk by one rule of truth. So also they, by all means convenient, are to have the counsel and help one of another, if necessary, require it as members of one body in the common faith under Christ their head. And so this portion, this statement is bringing in the, uh, the, the truth of what we are as individual congregations still joined together with the, the, the whole uh, body, as it were, the whole kingdom, the whole city of Christ. And, uh, and we are distinct, but many bodies, but we're knit together with the rule of faith that's been given to us in Christ Jesus and under Christ Jesus. Um, reading again, 1 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 14. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14, it says, These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, in other words, just summarize what we went through last time, and then we'll continue with this portion. But verse 14, in other words, these things write I unto you. Uh, Paul has written to Timothy. He's written to the church. Uh, he desires to see them personally. Uh, but his desire is, as he writes, to give the church direction and instruction as to what the purpose of the church body is. And uh, we know that quite often there, there are churches that uh, write a purpose statement. And we can even say our statement of faith is like a purpose statement. It's a, a long one, but it shows the purpose that we have in Christ. And one of the great purposes is, as he writes in verse 15, but if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Now, what Paul was writing here, he says, with the rest of the scriptures that he was written, they're not just his own personal thoughts. They are directed by, inspired by the, the Holy Spirit. And so this is God's word that he's given to us, given to the church. It's written, giving us the instructions on what we are to be, how we are to behave in the house of God or as the house of God. And so it's, it's not talking about how we behave in a building like this. We, we, of course, show respect to the owners of this building because they own it and uh, we want to have a good relationship with them. But the, the house that is spoken of, the, it, the house of God, is the, the body of believers. We are the temple. We are the habitation of God. And so how do we behave as that house of God, as members of the body placed together? When he uses the word ought, uh, we looked at that last time again, comes from word meaning to be bound. And so it means that it's not merely a multiple choice given to the church on if, if you want to behave this way or if you want to behave this way. 
pick which one. You know, we're bound to one rule of faith, one rule of truth under one ruler, and that is Christ. Now, the word behave has to do with living in a certain fashion, abiding in it, and begins, first of all, as Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Uh, that, that's basically what that is referring to, behaving, abiding in Christ, Christ's word abiding in us, and then it is evident in the fashion and the way in which we walk as the body of Christ, as the house of God. And so really the gist of this whole statement of Paul here is, is the way we ought to be as followers of Christ, as people of the book, people of the word, the way the church is to behave as people who are being sanctified by the scriptures and being conformed into the image of Christ. Now we'll come now to, to where we kind of started to get into, but we, we uh, had to end because of our time. But the overall behavior of the church is based on our identity. And it's our identity with Christ. Um, I'm not saying this is sinful. I don't say this is wrong in of itself, but uh, there are some Christian organizations that use the name of the, the person that was the founder. You know, you have Oral Roberts University, you have um, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, you have different types like that. And so when people think of that organization, they think of the identity of that person. Well, for the church, church as a whole, and church as the body, our identity is in not just any, any person except Christ. Uh, some even go so far and say that that's why you, you shouldn't call a church sovereign grace Baptist. You know, you call it the church of Christ. And, and again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, we understand what they're meaning when they say that, but the, it, it's more than just the name that we give ourselves to be identified. It is our identity as, uh, as that house of God. It's identity with the Lord Jesus Christ. If the church gleans its identity from the world, then it's basically worldly, right? If it finds its identity in a personality of other than Christ, it will often live and die based on that person. There are some uh, organizations, and you even hear of them in history, who, who they rose up with, uh, with a certain figure who came with the idea of, you know, having that Messiah attitude. But that organization died when that person died, it didn't carry on, because that identity was no longer there. Uh, example would be Jim Jones in the People's Temple. Those types of things. But our identity is not found in the world. It's not, it's not found or based on cult personality, but on the person of Jesus Christ. And so <clears throat> verse 15, it says, which is the church of the living God. The church of the living God. Uh, just reading again, Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 10. But the Lord is the true, sorry, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. 
and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. In this, these two verses, we see the comparison between God, that he is the true God, he's the living God, and he is the everlasting God and King and Lord. He is the God of, of power and wrath. And then in verse 11, it makes reference to the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth What's going to happen to them? They shall perish. They're not eternal. They're not everlasting. In fact, they are not gods at all. It's only using that term as uh, the understanding of the, the people who were worshiping these idols and made of wood and stone, the creature rather than the creator, which Romans 1 very clearly shows was what led they, as they departed from the true and living God and suppressed the truth of God. They began to worship the creature over the creator. But this is the God that we are the church of. We're the church of the living God. This is the same God that we are brought into his, his mercy and in his kingdom and in the body of Christ. Uh, back here in Timothy, Timothy, uh, the young pastor, young shepherd of church in Ephesus, uh, he, he would have understood what it was to live in a society that was founded on idolatry. Ephesus was a city known for two things at the time of Paul and Timothy. It was known for its practicing of magic, dark arts, witchcraft, and also idolatry, pagan idolatry. And of course, uh, they somehow, of course, are in the same kingdom of darkness, but they, uh, they would uh, be focused on a different idea of, of uh, satanic worship and, and uh, use, seeking to keep people deceived with with fake or false uh, miracles of sorts. It was in that city, you recall, that there were silversmiths who, who made these small temples of Diana. They were maybe the first uh, tourist trap in the Ephesus where people would come from all over and they would purchase these silver temples, these little ones, and uh, give money to the, those who had made it. And then they would take those little temples and then they would present them in the large full temple of Diana. And so this is what Timothy saw and heard. And when souls were being saved, they were being brought out of that, out of the, out of the false temples being brought into the true and living temple, which is the church because those were idols, were of the church of the living God. Uh, and so before these people were converted to Christ through the preaching, they were involved in this worship, this false worship, false gods and goddesses. And, and, and you hear uh, fables and, and tales of, of people that would say, you know, that they would see these statues move or they would see them bleed and then you see that even come into the time of roman catholicism and the statues similar ideas of of these uh, statues of mary and statues of uh, the apostles and there's these false miracles signs and wonders that would deceive people but when we're saved, we're brought out of the falsehood, we're brought out of the deception, we're given light to see the truth, the truth of God and the truth that God gives because it's his church. And 
with the people in Ephesus, their identity was, was the idolatry and the witchcraft. And, and now when you're, they were saved, their identity was totally changed. That old identity was wiped away, wiped out. And like us, their identity was the living God. If you uh, just go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 14, we read, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty." Our identity is found in the living God, the living God who gave himself on the cross. He calls us saying, come out from among them, come out and be separate from them. And here we, we see the comparison, but what is fellowship? Uh, fellowship is not talking about the fact of, of uh, you know, if you've got unsaved family members and loved ones that, It's not saying you can't get together with them and have a coffee and enjoy a dinner together and enjoy Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and all these sorts of things. What this is talking about is the fellowship that is found in Christ Jesus. Fellowship we have with God. We can't share that with idolatry. We can't share that with unrighteousness. Can't have that same fellowship that uh, because it's as different as light and darkness as he says what agreement is there in, in these two things especially again he's dealing with Corinth there and Corinth was similar to Ephesus a, a city of of uh, idolatry and when a person was saved they were no longer to have anything to do with that old life and, and we could bring it down to the fact that's the same for us. No matter if a person was born in an idolatrous sort of uh, life or just a a humanistic sort of life, a, a materialistic sort of life, when you're saved, you're brought out of that and you're, it's no longer your identity. You're no longer identified with those things of sin, the things of the world, because of the fact your identity identity is now Christ, who dwells in us, who walks in us. He says, I will dwell in them. Uh, And that verse 16, that's that's a very strong word, a beautiful word of dwelling, meaning he's taken up residence. And he's not going to be evicted. (laughs) He is there. And and so he dwells in us as his habitation, as his temple. And walking in them shows that in reference to the fact that he is the living God in us, working in us to both will and do of his good pleasure. As he walks in us, he causes us to walk. And live for his glory. And so our behavior, coming back to Timothy, and the behavior of 
the church of Christ is all based upon that and based upon him, uh, based on our identification as being the church of the living God. And so if we go back to, to our portion of scripture, I always forget if it was first or second, or somebody yell it out. First Timothy. First Timothy. Thank you. Okay. So first Timothy three again in verse 15. So the way in which we behave ourselves in the house of God, we are the church of the living God. Uh, the way we are to behave is as the pillar and ground of the truth. This is, this is the foundation as Ephesians, and Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he writes that we are, we are built upon the foundation, which is upon the apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus being the chief cornerstone. We are built on that. And so when you look at the, the old buildings of those ancient period, there was a foundation and what was put on that foundation? Pillars. <laughs> what did the pillars do? It held the building, held the structure up, right? God has called us and he's given us quite a responsibility. We're, we're not just pretty pictures on the wall. We are the pillars and those pillars are to be pillars of truth, pillars of God's word. The church, uh, again, in um, Ephesus, again, this is where Paul or or Timothy was a minister of, and actually Paul would have probably ministered there for a while as a shepherd of that flock, the new flock. And then uh, John was, uh, I believe, one of the shepherds for a while there. Uh, what they, of course, taught was not just, you know, how, how to, you know, have a good productive life but how to be pillars of truth in a idolatrous, deceived community and culture, society. Um, now, something happened with that church in Ephesus. And I want us to turn for a few moments just to see what happened there. And uh, so if you turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation Now one of the temples main temple there in the temple of Diana also called the temple of um, Artemis was a uh, quite a quite a structure. It was uh, quite massive. And it, of course, had those pillars, it actually had 127 pillars holding up the roof. Uh, the pillars were made of solid marble. And they were studded with jewels. And then they're also overlaid with gold. Uh, each of those pillars was a gift from a king. Each pillar represented the nobility of the one who gave the pillar. So it was a tribute to the one it represented. Uh, the, the temple was like so many others, the pillars and ground of falsehood and deception. And so when the Lord established that church body in Ephesus, 
it was again highlighting the fact that they had been taken out of this deception, falsehood, and brought into the kingdom of truth and righteousness. And uh, we know that over the years that temple stood very proudly with arrogance of those who were uh, part of it, but the temple crumbled, no longer stand strong. Well, sad to say, the church in Ephesus also began to crumble and began to crumble quite quickly. In chapter 2 of Revelation, beginning at verse 1, we read, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and have borne and have patience, and for my namesake has labored and have not fainted. Now, this starts off really good, doesn't it? I mean, the, the Lord Jesus is commending them, and he's commending them for good things. They, they are people, they are a church that knows their doctrine. They are very strong in making sure that there are those who, if they uh, are, bring in falsehood, they're dealt with right away. They're not listened to. And, and so that part, they weren't crumbling. They were still being the pillar of truth. But it goes on in verse 4. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the Lord commends this church in Ephesus, and it's a, it's a good commendation. I think this is, we would desire for the Lord to say that for us, not seeking to, you know, boast about it, but to be thankful if we are continuing to be a church that upholds the truth. We're patient in our labors and our, we're, we, we uh, work quickly to not bear with evil and to not listen to those and accept those who come as false apostles and are liars. And so Christ, he commends them for their, their uh, labor, another translation actually for labor. And maybe if you've got a different translation, it might use the word troubles or uh, trials or even sorrow. And so this isn't just talking about, you know, doing hard labor. This is the labor of, uh, it, it, it can cover various things, uh, being patient in tribulation, the troubles from, from those who are, are the idolaters who, 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 you know, maybe would beat them, put them in prison, their families who would who would reject them because they now are followers of Christ and they're bearing with that and they're continuing on, they're laboring through it. Uh, and so the commendation is the way in which they continue to stand for the ministry, still stand as pillars, standing in the face of trouble. There's also mention of their patience. The patience refers to... Uh, to the fact that they're not patient with sin. They're not patient with false teaching. They're not patient with uh, evil, but they have a godly patience. They, they don't have room for patience with sin, but they have room for, for the being patient through trials, through, through those who are against them because of their, their identity with Christ and being pillars in their community for the truth of the gospel. Uh, they expose those that claim to be apostles of Christ, but preach another gospel. They, 
they were not easily led astray from what Paul had first brought to them and preached to them the gospel. There was a time in which Paul, when he was on his uh, being taken to uh, Rome, at one of the ports, he requested that the elders of, of the church in Ephesus come and meet with him. He knew that that was probably the last time he would ever see them again. And at that time, he told them about the very fact that when he was gone and they're continuing on the ministry, there will be those who will sneak in, who will come in, the wolves in sheep's clothing, and they will try to destroy, they'll try to disrupt, they'll try to divide the flock. And so he told them, he exhorted them to, to know the truth and uphold the truth. And this is what they did. So when there were those who came preaching another gospel, they had nothing to do with them. The door was closed to them. And so even down to verse 6, it says, But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The term Nicolaitans means destruction of people. And it refers to those type, those false professors who use the, the words of, the, of religion, the words even of the gospel and the church as a means of destroying the church, to knock down the pillars, to destroy lives rather than supporting. So they're, they're not pillars. They're wanting to bring the house down. And so the church of Ephesus, they're commended for hating. Yes, there are things we must hate. With a godly hate, a righteous hatred. What God hates, we must hate. And, uh, and so the, the church in Ephesus was commended for this form of hatred. Because it's a hatred for falsehood. It's a hatred for what destroys and divides rather than unites in Christ. And so for the most part, Ephesus, the church of Ephesus was pretty solid in their stand for the truth, pretty solid pillars in the church. Uh, they started off well, and some things they continued to move on well. So on the surface, they, they look like they were pretty strong. They're solid Bible-believing, Jesus-following Congregation, probably the first Ephesus Baptist Church. <laughs> Yet the truth would soon be told and shows to us what is presented throughout Scripture, and that is, yes, we are the, to be the pillar of truth, pillar and ground of truth. Yet, you can have all the truth you want or spout all the truth you want and even believe all the truth you want. But if it doesn't have the love of Christ, identifying with the love of Christ in our hearts, it, it, it weakens the church. It weakens the pillars. And this is what happened. So verse four, it says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. You have left your first love. And so after the Lord says all these good things about this congregation, he gives to them this sad revelation that something is wrong. Something is missing. And if they have any problems, what he says to them could very well be the root. And the sin that Jesus charges the church in Ephesus with, excuse me, could be very common today especially here in North America. He tells them what in all their standing for truth and all their outward deeds and, and being patient, which are, which are good, uh, standing against false teachers, false apostles, the deception, the lies, uh, but they had left their first love. And they're fulfilling all the necessary functions and purposes of the truth, but they, they lack the spirit, the spirit of Christ, which is the love of Christ. 
They're, they, they looked on the surface to be the same church that God had used Paul to establish and that Timothy had pastored. And again, even John had pastored. And, and we know that John was one who we could say was the apostle of love. So they had no excuse. The apostle John was one who tradition says that when he, uh, the last time he was taken out of a, a church assembly, which where they were worshiping on a stretcher, on the day that he would be taken by the Lord in, in death, those were his final words were love one another, love one another. Now, I think this, uh, this love is more than just loving one another. I, I believe what they had lost was love for Christ, love for the doctrines of Christ that they so vehemently stood there and, and spoke and supported. Uh, the love we have for the Lord, the affection and desire that we have for truth must be a true love. If not, then it becomes just legalism. It can become just dry, dead beliefs, no life. Um, it must be that all we do, all we say is according to and with the love of Christ in our hearts. And most of all, love for Christ himself, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, these words that you know quite well. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. And so he writes in verse 5 of here in Revelation, Remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent. Showing that this isn't a small thing for that church, this church body. There's a call to repent because you've fallen. And you go through some of the, the areas of, of Italy or you go to Greece, go to these other areas where they would have these great buildings with, with uh, great pillars. And in many places you just see pillars broken and fallen onto the ground, no longer holding up the edifices, the buildings that they were built for. So he's saying, you're a pillar that's fallen over. Repent. And then he says, do the first works. That is, uh, when it says about do the first works, what this is actually calling that fallen pillar to do it doesn't mean that 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 Christian has to or uh, be born again and again and again. You know, it's not calling them to be saved again. But what it's saying is, repent and return to that first love you had for the truth, that first love you had for Christ, that first love that that the Holy Spirit spread abroad in your heart for what saved you in the first place. Don't just be a dry, crumbling pillar. Continue to have that life of the love of Christ spread abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And that's what restores the pillars. And so as the pillar and ground of truth, you have to have both. You have to have the truth, but you have to have the love of Christ. You have to have the love for the one who is the truth. That's where it is truly alive. And so he says, remember from where you are fallen and repent. Turn away from that lifeless keeping of, of rules or traditions or, or even just a, a, a dead following of, of doctrine. Repent and do the first works. 
become again like a, a new zealous believer again. And that can be for the church as a whole, that, that the Lord would revive his church, revive his temple so that we are truly living and loving as the people of God, as the pillar of God. We'll end there, but if, are there any thoughts, any um, things, questions? Is there any estimate of the Ephesus words? I have known it in the past, but I can't remember what it is now. It's kind of. So I'm wondering if it was would be more than 500. So. Um, it, yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe at that time, by that time, it was. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I remember seeing a, a a place in which they, well, it's a seek in the book of Acts where it talks about Ephesus. It does talk about that there were many who were saved. Um, but I don't think it actually gives a number. It says they added to the church daily. Yeah, yeah. So it was, he talked about an Ephesus there. So I don't, I don't know exactly the number, but mm -hmm. it was probably over time did get to, to grow quite, grow so much that it really affected the, uh, the silver makers, yeah. silver smiths. Because he said uh, Thessalonica, for the church of, I mean, the city was all 200,000 people. Yeah, yeah, they were big cities. They're definitely, yeah. yeah. So I forget which city it was. Was it Ephesus or I forget which one where Paul was stoned, thrown out. And then he, the Lord said to go back in because he says, I have many in there still. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the one. Yeah. Well, anything? Well, may the Lord... Give us strength to be strong pillars, pillars of truth and love. Pardon? Oh, thank you. Yeah.